All right, fantastic. Uh, we're going to come back and talk about linear regression. Um, so uh, the first thing we're talking about is the linear regression model. Uh, we uh, have a feature vector, which is my input. Um, typically, we refer to the input as a feature vector. And uh, we assume that uh, the feature vector has p dimensions, right? So uh, it's a vector that it's really a column vector. Uh, it goes from 1 to p, OK? So uh, and the output, we assume that is a scalar y, OK? So and the model we are trying to learn is completely linear uh, in the sense that it is a um, it can be represented as a straight line, or it is linear in the uh, uh, parameters. Um, so um, uh, the uh, the input is x1, x2, all the way to xp. And for each input dimension, I have a, excuse me, model parameter, um, beta1, beta2, uh, through beta p. And on top of that, I also have a parameter beta0, right? Uh, so uh, you can, I can write things in a vector form uh, where beta is, again, column vector containing all these values from beta one to beta p, and that has a dot product with my input vector x. So that gives you a, the first p terms. Um, and the last term is uh, beta zero, uh, which is not part of dot product. And uh, the beta zero is referred to as sometimes the bias or the offset. Okay, so, so that's, that's basically our functional form. I'm going to use uh, y hat to denote the prediction of the model, whereas the ground truth value gt, the ground truth value uh, is y without the hat. So the hat is my way of saying this is a prediction. This is an estimate of the real value y. Um, so we have some data points. Um, I'm going to denote these data points as x1, y1, x2, y2 and all the way to x, y, x n, y, n, uh, I'm going to use the superscript, superscript um, to denote the data number, right? Data instance number. Um, so, and the subscript, well, x1, for example, denote that this is the first dimension of my vector x. So the subscript denotes the uh, dimension number. Um, the assumption, uh, just like every uh, machine learning model, uh, we assume that the data points uh, follow uh, this model um, with the same beta and the same beta zero. And you can plug in any xi, and that should give you a value that is uh, pretty close to the actual ground truth yi. But this is like the estimated value, right? So um, the central question of supervised machine learning really is how do we find um, these model parameters, right? So I have defined these parameters, beta and beta zero. Uh, what, how do I determine the optimal values for them? Um, so uh, before I move on, uh, I want to just tweak our notation just a little bit. Uh, so previously, I have p dimensions for uh, x. But now I'm going to add one more dimension. So uh, after p uh, after xp, I have a, another dimension, um, which is xp plus one. Uh, but I'm just gonna say this dimension is always equal to one. Okay, so it's always equal to one, and the reason I do that is that I'm also going to augment the beta parameter and put beta zero as the p plus one dimension of this vector. Okay, so when I dot do a dot product. This new beta multiplying this new x, this will give me uh, exactly what I said earlier, which is like x1 times beta1, uh, x2 times beta2, all the way to uh, xn times, sorry, xp times beta p plus beta0 times 1, which is beta0. Uh, so this is exactly the same uh, linear model that we have specified earlier. But now we have a pretty good a more simplified uh, a vector form, uh, analytical form, right? So 
Uh, that's my small tweak. And to fit this model is equivalent to finding a straight line or a plane or a hyperplane. Um, so in 2D, in the 1D case, really, if my input is a single dimension, a single scalar. So this is my input X and this is my output Y. Okay. And so each point is a data point, let's say X1, Y1, and maybe this is my X5, uh, uh, Y5, maybe. Um, so each of the blue dot is um, a input data point in the training set, and I can draw them, I can locate them on this 2D diagram, right? So, and uh, the model, the linear model I am fitting is just the this line here, right? So after I fit this line, I will be able to read off um, any, for any X values that, you know, no matter if it has appeared uh, or not in the training set, I will be able to find the corresponding Y value, right? So just to give you an example, if I just randomly pick a X value X prime, um, I go to this straight line and the straight line, the value on the line will tell me, you know, what is the corresponding uh, value of Y, right? So so that is uh, the machine learning model that we have fit and to the, to the training data, to the blue dots. And uh, the intuition behind linear regression um, is just to find the straight line that is closest to the observed data point. All right, so this is a straight line. This is the one D case. Uh, I mean, my in input is one dimensional. Um, I could do a two D case. Okay, uh, so I have uh, two uh, dimensions. This is my x one, and this is my x two. And uh, this this one this this dimension uh, is my y, okay. And uh, in if I do this, uh, and my my data points can be represented as three D points as points in three D space. Um, and my job uh, for linear regression becomes finding the best two D plane that is closest to all the observed data points, right? For some definition of closest, uh, which I will talk about in a few moments. Uh, what about higher dimensions? Uh, it turns out that we are 3D creatures, okay? It's kind of really hard for us to imagine anything above 3D. Um, in our mind, they can exist, but to visualize them on paper, uh, I think that's pretty hard. Uh, but uh, we would we would just give it some mathematical names and um, you could you could try to imagine these things, right? So in in uh, 4D, a plane is not a plane. We would call that a hyperplane. And once again, we find the hyperplane that is closest to the observed data points. Um, so uh, the 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 interesting thing about the linear model is that uh, one unit change in x always results in one unit change. Uh, in the predicted value, right? So uh, if I increase xi by one, um, the y hat, my prediction will be will increase by the amount of beta i. Right? Similarly, if I decrease x y xi by one, then uh, the predicted value will decrease by beta one, right? So um, it, no matter what is the current value of y hat or xi, right? so so that means you know the model we're fitting. It's just really a linear model, right? So that's kind of an interesting thing. And that's what makes these models really easy to understand. So you really understand this behavior like extremely well. Uh, so we talked about, you know, closest, sorry, closest to the data points. Okay, so uh, by close, if I talk about close or far, um, clearly I am talking about a particular distance matter, right? So you have to be, you have to know what is the distance. And um, so here I'm really taking the uh, squared distance. So if I have, you know, my ground truth value uh, is y hat, y i, and my uh, predicted value is y i hat, 
Okay, so I'm going to, what's, how wrong am I, right? So I'm going to take their difference. I'm going to use one to subtract the other. And for the difference, I'm going to square them. And that is how wrong I am really for the ith uh, data point. For the ith data point, right? So this is how wrong I am. Uh, and I am going to uh, do the summation uh, over all the data points from one to n. And I'm going to divide by divide the sum uh, by n. So, but it's basically taking the average uh, over all data points. Okay. So this is known as the mean square error. Okay. Uh, so we take the square error and we compute its mean. So mean square error. And if we do a vector notation, I'm going to let my y vector be equal to uh, y1. So this is. Here, one denotes the super, y, y, one is the superscript, which means it's the data point number. It's not really um, a, a vector dimension um, because, uh, you know, uh, the, the, for every data point, my output is always a scalar, but I am like putting everything into a vector. So uh, it's kind of easy to write these things, right? So I have y1, uh, y2 superscript, uh, y3 and all the way to yn and transpose. So this is my uh, y vector. And similarly, I have my y hat vector, which is the prediction on the first data point all the way to my prediction on the nth data point, transpose to denote this as a column vector. And the difference between these two vectors, and I take the L2 norm or Euclidean norm, all right, and uh, I'll square them and divide the thing uh, by n. So this is equivalent to uh, the the if this part of uh, the equation. Okay, so uh, so that is another way to write the, the this distance, and this is known as my measure of error or the loss function. So this is something I tried to minimize in order to find the best line or the plane or the best hyperplane, right? So the best hyperplane is defined as the hyperplane that minimizes uh, this loss function or this uh, measure of error, okay? Um, so really um, the, the central idea in machine learning is, or supervised machine learning, is that I want to find the model parameters that lead to the smallest error on all possible data. By all possible data, I mean this could include data from yesterday, but also data from tomorrow and data from the day after tomorrow. So what? Uh, how do I know what's going to happen the day after tomorrow? Well, I don't, OK? So I really don't have data from the future. Um, which is, you know, my test data, which I haven't seen uh, during training. So, uh, but I do want my model to perform well on those data points. And that's what, we, what I care about. Uh, for the data points I have already observed, you know, I don't care about them as much because, you know, if I see them again, I know what's the ground truth. So I have seen the paired value. So if I know the input, if the input is the same, the output should probably be the same or very close to the same value, right? So uh, for the training data, I don't really care about them that much. But I, what I really, really care about is the test data that I have not seen during training. But uh, we don't know what they are. Um, so all we can do is to uh, minimize the error on the training data and hope that maybe we can actually have low error on the test data. Um, so uh, that's kind of a weak uh, thing, um, but um, in many cases, uh, this kind of works, right? So we're not actually gonna talk about theories of generalization. Um, I think our, our understanding of these things are not very good um, at this moment, um, but um, uh, you know, there, there, there are certain uh, theories that you can, you can study uh, but we wouldn't really go into that deep mathematics in this course, really. Um, long story short, uh, we don't know uh, what our test is going to be. Um, so all we can do is try to minimize error on the training data and see uh, and hope uh, this will work out. 
And there are cases this we know this wouldn't work out, which is when the training data are too few. You know, we, we don't have enough data, so we don't have very good estimates of our parameters. Or maybe we do have abundant training data, but they are not representative of the test data. So maybe um, there are some distribution shifts um, between the training data and the test data. Um, and in these cases, we could resort to what we call regularization. So there are techniques that uh, would reduce uh, the re increase error on the training data, but reduce the error on the test uh, on scene test data. So we could do something like that. And then we will see uh, one type of regularization during uh, when we talk about read regression, right? So uh, first of all, how do we find the solutions uh, for uh, linear regression? Um, we can write things in a matrix form, which I which we like because they're pretty concise. Um, so we have the X matrix. And the X matrix is of the uh, this dimension. So we have uh, n rows and p plus one columns, and the last column is filled with ones. So each row is a data point. Okay, and we have oops, oops. I have y. I have my y vector, which is a vector of uh, n dimensions, because each data point has a scalar output. Okay, so if I do these things, so x times beta is basically uh, my y hat value, uh, and and it would do the difference, and it would do the norm squared, the average. Right. So this is, this is the same thing as the mean square error we have seen before. Now. Uh, we're going to use the same thing that we have been using um, like for quite some time. Like, How do I find a minimum for a particular function? In this case, my MSE, or sometimes also referred to my loss function. So how do I find the minimum for that? Um, I will take the derivative against the model parameter. This is the value I can change. I don't want to... So you always wanted to take the take the uh, derivative against the value you can change. Okay, so x is a given value. Y is a given value. There's no way you can change that. So you want to take the derivative against the thing you have control over. Okay, this then is called beta. So we take the derivative against the beta, and uh, that's, if you do the math, this is what you get. And uh, we're going to set that to zero. Okay, and we're going to solve that equation and find what's the optimal beta. So it's actually pretty easy to do. Um, take a look at these equations. Okay, we're going to so first disregard the constant 2 over n, and we are left with x transpose x beta minus x transpose y. So I'm going to move uh, x transpose y to the right-hand side. And then I'm going to multiply x transpose x inverse x transpose x beta. So I'm going to go into multiply x transpose x inverse on both sides of the equal sign. So this will be equal to x transpose x inverse x y. Okay. So we can see that these two terms cancel out, right? So the matrix and this inverse uh, cancel out and you get the identity. So you get beta equal to this thing. So this is the uh, solution. Okay, this is the solution we find for uh, linear regression. And uh, this part is known as the pseudo uh, inverse. Okay, so, so that's uh, what we have, okay. So we claim that this is a minimum, okay? We want to minimize MSE, and we claim if you find beta in this way, we minimize MSE. But is that is that really true? Is that really true? Okay. So we know that uh, derivative being zero is a necessary condition for the solution being a local minimum. Uh, we don't know if, uh, you could, but it's not a sufficient condition. So it could be a local maximum, or it could be something else, right? So uh, we have three pictures here. So here we have, for this one, we have a local minimum at this red dot, right? This is the smallest of all points around it. And uh, for this one, we have the local maximum. At the local maximum, 
uh, the derivative is still zero. So it could be a local maximum. Uh, it could also be a settle point. So a settle point is one point where it's a maximum along one dimension. So if you take this dimension, let's say this is x1, that is the maximum, right? So all those points are less than this point, this red point in the middle. So this is actually a local maximum. And if you take the direction x2, uh, it's this function. If you slide the loss function surface uh, like along uh, the, the, the direction of x2, uh, you have this, this function and where this red dot is the local minimum. So it's local minimum on some dimensions and local maximum on some other dimensions. Um, so it's neither really. So it's known as the settle point. Okay. So uh, so we're going to uh, determine, in order to determine uh, whether it's which case it is, uh, the first order condition, meaning the first order derivative um, is not enough. So we need to look at the second order derivative. Okay, so second order conditions. Now, what, what is the second order condition? Now, let's just do something simple. So I think most of you have done something like this, is like a quadratic function, um, y equal to uh, 2ax squared plus uh, bx plus c. Um, you know, you have, you have done this in like secondary school. Uh, and when um, a is greater than zero, uh, the function looks like, looks like something like that. And there is a minimum here, but there's no maximum, right? So the function can go, so can go on, like I'm not drawing this very well, can go on like that uh, forever. So there's no maximum. Uh, for, for a less than zero, you have a maximum. So the function looks like that, and there is the maximum point, but again, there's no minimum. Now for a is zero, if a is zero, so the function, and b is not zero, the function becomes something like bx plus c, and there's, this is like a straight line. So there's no minimum nor maximum, all right? Uh, so uh, the, the uh, A value, it turns out it's, it's critical, right? So we, we need to look at the A value to determine uh, if there is a maximum or if there's a minimum. And uh, A value is actually the second order derivative, right? So this is, oops, second order derivative of Y against x. So it's just a. So this value is, is critical in determining if, if this is positive, sorry, if it's a local maximum or local minimum. And uh, we're going to do something similar, uh, but our case is uh, multi-dimensional, okay? So it's not like a 1D case uh, here. So in that case, the second order derivative is no longer a uh, scalar, it is a matrix. And we have seen this matrix before, and it's known as the Heisen matrix. Okay, so the, the Heisen matrix for the diagonals, we have the uh, uh, second order derivatives uh, uh, of each dimension of beta. And for the off diagonals, uh, we have differentiating, we're differentiating against two dimensions from beta. So this is, this is the, uh, the uh, high CM matrix. And uh, we can see this is the symmetric matrix because the off diagonal terms, right? These are all identical. Um, so, so, okay. So that is second order condition. And uh, um, we, we talked about uh, whether a matrix is positive definite or negative definite or things like that uh, when we talk about linear algebra. So it turns out these things are very useful here. All right, so uh, positive definite, um, let's just recall the definition. Uh, a matrix is positive definite if and only if for all vectors x not equal to zero, this quadratic form x transpose ax is greater than zero, no matter what x is, as long as x is not equal to zero, right? So this is a pretty strong condition. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, one type of uh, positive definiteness is because, you know, you can write things as, a form of squares and uh, the squares cannot be all uh, zero at the same time. Uh, so it has to be greater than zero or something like that, right? So uh, so this is positive definite matrices. Okay.
Now it turns out that uh, whether uh, you know, in addition to positive definite, you have positive semi-definite, negative definite, negative semi-definite. Depending on the sign uh, of the quadratic form, is it greater than zero, less than less than zero, greater or greater or equal to zero, and less than or equal to zero. So, uh, so there's, there's there are four types of matrices like that, and of course there there are matrices that do not fall under any of these cases. Depending on uh, which case it is, it turns out you can tell if something is a local minimum or a local maximum. So, if the Hessian is a positive semi-definite matrix, um, you have a local minimum. If it is a negative semi-definite, you have a local maximum. If the Hessian is neither PSD nor NSD, you have a settle point. Okay, so that's that's what we got. All right. And uh, so what is the second order uh, matrix? What is the Hessian matrix here? So if we look at the MSE loss, this is my MSE loss, and I do the second order uh, computation, um, I will find out that this is uh, really my uh, uh, second order uh, derivative of H against, sorry, of L against beta, okay? So, and we really don't care about the constant two over N, so it's a constant. It's not gonna affect whether a matrix is positive or negative uh, definite, okay? So, so we can safely disregard the constant and check if this matrix is PSD, or NSD or something like that, right? So we can convincingly show, uh, it's very simple proof that this matrix is indeed uh, PSD, why? Okay, so I'm gonna take an arbitrary vector Z and which is non-zero and I do the quad quad quadratic form, uh, Z transpose fun matrix Z and this, I can t see this is equal to XZ transpose. Okay, and then I have x z, and I'm going to let x z be a vector called a. So this will be a, and this will be also a. So the whole thing becomes a transpose a, and a transpose a is equal to a norm uh, squared. Okay, and we know that since uh, a is a uh, real vector. Uh, this whole thing will always be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so this is indeed, uh, the matrix is indeed PSD and this is truly a local minimum. Okay, now uh, look, it turns out that this is not only a local minimum, but also a global minimum. Okay, because the loss function is actually convex. Um, we wouldn't, we don't want to get in too much mathematics, so we wouldn't show that. Uh, but if you're interested, I'm sure you can find uh, a lot of materials online that shows you that, right? So the local minimum is also the global minimum. Uh, so that is my solution, okay? So that is my solution. Um, that minimizes the loss uh, or the MSE function. And this is often referred to as the ordinary least squares solution or the OLS solution. Okay, so we wanted to stop here and take a minute and think about what we just did. Okay, so we started from some data points, x1, y1, and x2, y2, and so on. And we specified a model. Um, we have some model parameters beta, and then we have input xi, and there's some interaction between uh, the model parameter and the input, and that gives me yi, right? And after that, I have a loss function or the mean square error function, um, and I uh, minimized that. I find, so this is this is the error function I defined, and I found a procedure to minimize this function um, and get the corresponding beta, right? So I find the model parameter beta that minimizes the loss function, and uh, that's what I do. Okay, so so if you wanted to uh, kind of, uh, if I wanted to kind of divide uh, the machine learning uh, recipe uh, into two parts, into the innate 
and the experiential, or rather the human design versus the data driven. Um, I can see that you know uh, the red parts, these two steps, step two and three, uh, these are my design, right? I have to specify what model it is. I have to specify what kind of loss function there is, and uh, the data, you know, it's it's data driven. It's whatever data gives you that we don't have a lot of control over. And from the data, we can learn the model parameter. We can determine the model parameter beta. And we could say these are data-driven steps, right? So as we saw, you know, machine learning has an innate a human design aspect and the data-driven aspect. So this is, this is actually a very, very important recipe that we're going to follow for uh, most of this course, right? So whenever you have some kind of supervised machine learning, you would follow this recipe. You specify, you get some data points um, that have ground truth annotations. You specify a model, um, you define a loss function, and you find the model parameters that minimizes this loss function. And we do this over and over again. So this is really one of the most important slides in the entire course. Okay. Okay, so we're going to take another break and uh, after that, we are going to talk about ridge regression.